now it's Dan Eberhard here, today's host of the Growing the Future podcast. We are back with Season 4, Episode 17. You can sign up for our newsletter at growingthefuturepodcast.ca to get emails about all of our new episodes. And you can find all of our past episodes there. Please give us a follow on social media platforms and check out our YouTube. You can catch the video portions of our conversations there. You can also find the Eberhardt family of companies online, starting with eberhardtfarms.com. To learn more about our farming operation in Saskatchewan, suregrowth.ca. To learn more about the precision agronomy consulting services offered there, convergencegrowth.com, where they accelerate solutions across food, health, and agriculture. And last but not least, aberhardagsolutions.ca, where we deliver one of a kind fertility solutions of the future to your farm. My next guest, I'm very excited to speak to. I think this is uh, extremely practical value for the folks uh, listening to this, uh, largely our audience is Western Canadian producers. The tools that this fellow's company has been bringing to the market really have practical value in honing your fertility practices to get the best results possible. We have worked with this company uh, extensively in our own company and our own fertilizer practices um, on our own uh, fertilizer and yield quest. Uh, he has been a professional agronomist for over 30 years, and it won't take you long listening to this man to understand the depth of knowledge and experience that he he brings to the market. And he's one of the first people in Canada to earn the designate as a certified crop advisor. He is known for sharing what he learns, not in order to win an argument, but because he believes it's what's happening in the soil. And you hear his conviction in his voice and in his words as we speak today, he's, uh, as an agronomist, he believes there needs to be a greater level of awareness of adjusting practices. So there will be a spot where the rubber hits the road in our, in our sometimes philosophical but very practical and scientific conversation today. Uh, Greg will be bringing the science. I will not be. Uh, that's his expertise. Uh, but he's the co-founder of a and Biological. It's a new company on the frontier of what, what's called the Evergreen Revolution. Uh, he's also the founder and CEO of a l Canada Laboratories. Today, I want to delve into the history and evolution of fertility and our, and our practices and our thinking about it. This is an area of, of agriculture that endlessly fascinates me. And uh, new, new universes and frontiers are opening up on that front. Um, I want to talk about all of the complex interactions in the soil and how we, how we start to manage them and how, how is companies doing so? And really the, also the history and evolution uh, concurrent to all this new technology with his companies and what they're doing with technology and, and maybe hear a little bit about Greg's journey, building a company as well and, and some of the ups and downs. So welcome to the show, Greg Patterson. Thank you, Dan. I'm glad to be here. Hopefully, uh, we can cover all the ground you just talked about <laughs> in the time you've allotted. <laughs> I know it's ambitious, but uh, I think it's important. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, you've been hosting a series of of educational seminars. And of course, I think that you like to do them in person, but obviously in COVID, there's it became one of those things you did virtually. And so there was a presentation that you did the other day really on um, microorganisms and, you know, the evergreen revolution and seed endophytes and all that. And in that, you talked about the history of fertility, which I think should be taught in schools and not many people know. And it, and it behooves us to do so because it gives us perspective on where we're coming, where, where we're going to. But not a lot of people know that really the first big revolution in fertility that enabled uh, expansive population growth in a way that had never been possible before really is a bunch of bird shit off the, off the coast of, of Peru due to a very specific set of circumstances uh, uh, in terms of the, the ocean currents and how arid it was and how this stuff piled up for a thousand years. And, and, and really, if you can picture it, there was a, a lineup of ships at one point, kind of like we are at Tim Hortons as Canadians today, you know, lined up for our, our double doubles or whatever it is that we get ships lined up to, to load guano and go around the world and, and, and foster the, uh, the population uh, near the end of the 1800s and beginning in the 1900s. Can you, can you, can you start there and, and talk about, fertility starting 
there and, and sort of bring us through a history of how we got to where we are with um, achieving the yields we are today, Greg? Well, yeah, you're right. A lot of that started with uh, back in those days, there was not a lot of fertilizer available, and we did see response to using animal manures to, to grow a crop more effectively, more efficiently. And this natural resource of bird guano on this island um, was sitting there, like you said, collected for for years and years and years from these these ocean birds, and uh, the Peruvians started mining it and and distributing globally for a fertilizer application to farms, uh, to the point where they had had to restrict the, the removal of this manure because it was basically being depleted and rationed out a little more because they were concerned about that reserve being lost. I mean, at that time, also. Chilean nitrates were starting to be mined, and we were using those in production agriculture around the world. But it was a slow, a slow um, movement into these um, soil amendments because most farms back then had some kind of livestock on the farm, and we kind of used the manure to grow the crops and, and so on, which you know, as we all know today, is not the case. Um, so, also at that time, farmers really understood the need for for lime. So the precision agriculture we claim to be a new revolution today happened way back in the early 1900s with uh, farmers pacing off a field, taking soil samples and measuring pH across that field to come up with a, with a hand-drawn map of how they're going to apply the lime to the field because they understood that back then fertilizer, other than this bird guano, uh, fertilizer was lime. Uh, lime the soil, get the soil balanced pH-wise, and nutrients would come out of the soil that would feed the plant and things were good. So they would developed these maps. Um, they didn't have fancy things like GPS and all the things we have in satellites we have today, but they would step off so many steps in the field and take a soil sample, and they go another so many steps and take both the topsoil and subsoil sample, and then they draw these these maps and then load the lime onto a buckboard or whatever and drag it out in the field and shovel the lime off into into these areas to, to basically um, balance the soil. So back then, I... I I seem to think that we are a little more holistic in our approach to agriculture than than we are going forward. And that's what we call kind of the first revolution in agriculture. The Moving forward into the 50s, um, we come on with the late 40s, 50s, uh, the second green revolution um, with the advent of um, nitrogen products, the Haber-Bosch um, nitrogen um process and we also had breeding going on in grains for shorter straw in grain to, to stop the lodging uh, more use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers uh, application amendments to soils so we also had uh, pesticides come in at that era so a whole bunch of things happening that made agriculture more more productive uh, and and just easier for farmers to grow a, a good crop so that whole process is what we classify as second a second green revolution, or the green revolution. They, we don't classify as a second, just a green revolution. So that moved agriculture forward quite quite substantially. But in my looking back at that and looking at what we did there, we went away from a more holistic approach to agriculture to something that's, in my mind, just not quite as holistic, but very much needed to get the production that we were looking at uh, to feed, to feed the globe and be economical. Um, today we're into what we call the evergreen revolution where we've gone back a step into something that's a little more holistic. We're looking at balanced fertility and how it impacts the, the microbiome, the soil, um, soil um, microbes. And in the work we've done at a Biologicals, we're looking at that whole piece of how the plants and, and, and humans uh, interact with these microbes in the, in the rhizosphere and in, in Again, getting back to a more holistic approach. Um, a lot of soil health interest is happening over that. I mean, this is not new. Uh, I think it was back in 2000 or 1908 or 09 when we first understood that microbes in the rhizosphere change or the plant has the ability to change these, these populations. And it's not, it's only been recently in the uh, late 1990s, um, in the 2000 that we really started looking at you know why is this happening and how is it happening um, when I started this company I met um, a now partner of mine George Lazarzovitz on who worked for the Federal Research Station on one of my partner's farms and he's looking at scab control in potatoes and and how we could amend the soil with 
other things to to enhance or reduce scab and enhance the organisms that actually fought scab in potatoes. And while I was developing a company, every time I had a question, and because I had a real con- or real interest in this whole microbiome thing, I would go to George and say, this is going on in this field. Um, I think we've upset some balance with microbes. And he'd take me to one of his, his, his growth rooms and say, this is what's going on. Uh, this is what you've applied, and this is how it's impacted the microbes. Um, you've applied this particular product, and it's basically given plants AIDS. So they're fighting disease no matter what you do. <laughs> So we we had that interaction, and then George and another team of researchers, uh, with some of the equipment that was coming along, and I might be digressing here, but Dan stopped me because I have a habit of doing that. Oh, it's all good. But he, um, him and Sean Hemmingson, they actually took soils from all around the world because they were doing research with other universities globally. And their idea was to take this new sequencing technology and sequence all the microbes in the soil and see if they could get a fingerprint of soils so that they could tell where the soil came from based on the microbes that are in that soil, um, where it came from. And, you know, what they found out was that didn't exist. What existed was all soils, no matter where they come from on the planet, have the same group of microbes. So there's the only differentiation is there'd be different concentrations of microbes in these soils, but they all had the same bugs. And they found bugs, they, microbes they never even knew existed and couldn't even classify. Um, so that begged the question, well, why are soils different? Why do some soils suppress disease? And why do some soils have more disease, more productivity, productivity or less productivity? So it begged the question on, on why these things were happening. So we started doing research together on, on looking at that and looking at you know what existed and, and what caused, you know when we saw disease, what bugs were in the soil causing these issues or, or reducing these issues. And again, what George was looking for is that holy grail. What does a disease-suppressive soil look like? And how can we reproduce that? Um, and we kept going forward with that. We were working on different projects together. We wrote a paper back in, uh, I think it was 1994 together, on scab control in potatoes that is now recognized worldwide, and, and growers actually use it. And it's, it's a cultural practice balancing fertility rather than using um, any kind of a, a pesticide to do that. And it works very well. Um, so I said to George, you know, with all this going on and what we've done for the last 20 years together, when are we going to be able to take this technology to the, to the farmer? The sequencing technology, being able to understand these microbes, um, when can, how can we take this to the farmer? He said to me, he said, well, when I'm ready to retire from the federal government, let's start a company. But right now we don't have uh, the equipment's not is not um, accessible enough to commercialize it. So a few years went by, and then finally he said, "Greg, I'm ready to retire. Uh, let's do this." Um, so we started Anobiologicals back in 2008, and we focused on looking at soil health uh, over that whole period of time. Uh, we are not looking at counting earthworms. We are not looking at aggregate stability, although we we understand that they all are part of it, but the earthworms are there because the soil is healthy. They didn't make the soil healthy. So it's, it's, you've got to understand what came first. So how do we recognize a healthy soil and how can we... The idea with ANL Biologicals was to understand how the plant is actually changing its environment. And, you know, we look at the relationship between humans and plants very similarly. Uh, we do work with the University of Western on their human health work. And they're very interested in the work we're doing on soil health because this whole cultivation of, of microbial biomes, either in the human gut or in the rhizosphere, is very similar. And through nutrition, we, we develop a better gut um, biome. And through nutrition, the plant produces its own gut biome. Now, the gut of the plant is the rhizosphere. So if we have balanced nutrition going to a plant, that plant then uh, exudes the right compounds to actually reach out and sequestral the amount or the, the, the particular bugs that it wants in the rhizosphere to help it accomplish its life cycle and, and do things it wants to do. But it can't do that, just like we can't be healthy if we don't eat the right diet. A plant can't do that unless it has the right diet. <clears throat> so this holistic approach to understanding plant nutrition is starting to become a little more apparent in production now, agriculture, and 
it's not just about sunshine, rain, and nitrogen anymore. <clears throat> and unfortunately, that's where the green revolution took us. Um, uh, with all the technology we had with better equipment, better breeding practices, more pesticides or, or ways of controlling the damages we're doing, um, it took us the wrong direction. It, it took us away from that more holistic approach to something that's just more uh, get her done type approach and, and just crank, crank out the yields. So fortunately, we're moving back to an understanding of our environment. Um, it has a lot to do with this whole green environment thing because people are more consciously aware of what we can be doing by not doing the right things. Um, so this 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 uh, work we've been doing in, in soil microbiology has been very interesting. And it's it's interesting to watch how a plant responds. And we've actually done research where we can actually we can actually see how the plant is changing its rhizosphere. We can see how the plant actually manipulates those bugs in the rhizosphere. We can see how the plant actually, when it gets a certain nutrient base, it brings in the army, brings in a set of bugs that actually destroys a lot of the population in the rhizosphere that are just the freeloaders. And the, guy, the guys in the neighborhood are just robbing from the good guys. <laughs> Kicks them out of the neighborhood and allows for uh, the more beneficial organisms to occupy the rhizosphere and um, the plant can then the plant can feed, uh, can can continue to cultivate them. So the plant actually cultivates these organisms, and we have to understand how we can help the plant do that. And doing that, we're seeing some pretty amazing things happen in our production work that we're working with. Um, we're seeing endophytes taken up by the plant, um, where nitrogen is being fixed by corn. Uh, and I'm not talking about nodulating rhizobium. I'm talking about nitrogen fixers endophytes that are actually in the plant and we can measure them and count them and we see them uh, we know what stimulates them now and i mean you can reduce your nitrogen application by 50 percent in producing a crop and i, I want i want to clarify that a little bit because i'm not saying if i'm using 150 pounds of nitrogen now i'm going to end up using um 75 pounds I, i'm not saying that i'm saying that when i talk about nitrogen needs per unit of production i'm going to use half of what i'm using today compared to what I would normally use because these endophytes are fixing so much nitrogen. An example of that, um, we, we saw demonstrated in a field we worked on at Dean Glennie's site where he was producing over 300 bushel of corn and he was using 0.8 to 0.9 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of production. His neighbor um, was producing um, 160 bushel of, of corn and using 1.8 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. And I'm including uh, estimated nitrogen or mineralized nitrogen from organic matter plus application and, and the, whole, the whole group to come up with that. So Dean was putting on a little over 200, 220 pounds of nitrogen to do that. Um, the other farm was putting on 260 to 280 pounds of nitrogen to do half, half as much. So it's not about the actual amount. It's, it's the amount of nitrogen per unit of production. But in all that, too, we measured um, nitrogen released in the groundwater, residual nitrogen at the end of the year in soils, and in the highly productive field where the endophytes were doing the work and he was applying a, a more conservative amount of nitrogen, um, we had no residual nitrogen. We had no nitrogen gassing off. We had no nitrogen going to groundwater, no phosphates being released to the groundwater. So the whole system was a much cleaner system because... Uh, these bugs were doing so much of the work. Uh, and, and that's where we'll get to. So the benefit there is, yes, we'll reduce nitrous oxides. Um, yes, we'll, we'll reduce the cost of inputs per unit of production. Now, I'm not saying we're going to cut back on the, on the amount of nitrogen used. We're going to cut back on the, on the amount per unit of production and also reduce um, nitrogen left over after the whole thing's done. That can be an impact on the environment. So there's a lot of good coming out of it. And, and we see these endophytes once we understand how we can help the farm cultivate or the, the, the plant cultivate them and, and bring them into the rhizosphere. Things get much better. Less disease, better productivity. Our nutrient density goes up in the food we're producing. Uh, production goes up uh, and more efficiently. Uh, just a whole bunch of good things happen. But we really have to understand what that microbial balance needs to be. Who are the key players? 
what can we do in production agriculture to make sure that we don't do things to interrupt that or disturb that? And and that's not as bad it, not as bad as it sounds. These, these bugs are really resilient. And if we're feeding the plant properly and it's producing the right feed sources, these these microbes are really really resilient. It, we, there's not much we can do to to mess them up. Um, but we have to understand what as producers, what do we have to do or what should we be doing to help that plant cultivate those bugs? So I agree. And I, I think that uh, from listening to you in your presentations, I get that that your central theme and, and really a lot of your life work is around achieving balanced fertility with producers, helping producers achieve that. Because you say that balanced fertility leads to all these ancillary benefits of, of less disease uh, more soil interactions, you know, the traffic of, of nutrients between the roots and, and the soil. Uh, how do you define balanced fertility and how do you help the producer achieve that in your work? Well, the balanced fertility is, is all about understanding how the plant takes up nutrients. If you've ever read anything out of Marshner, um, the coefficient of diffusion is how the soil liberates certain nutrients. In other words, how the the soil releases nutrients to to the plant, and it's it's a it's a factor of the nutrient present and moisture availability. So there's there's a couple of key components here, but it also has a play on what is the ideal or optimal range. You talk about the four R's, and part of the four R's is placement. Too many people focus on the fact that placement is: do I side band it? Do I broadcast it? Well, placement to me is where it has to be to feed the plant. We put fertilizer on a field, only about 15% of what we apply gets in the plant that year. So you look at something like nitrogen, about 40 to 70% gets in the plant that year, what we apply. So it's it's not quite the same. So we really, and if we need one pound of potassium for every pound of nitrogen a plant uses, and we're only getting 15% from the potash we apply, that means the soil has to provide that difference from its reserves so it has to be there so when i talk about placement i'm talking about the right place for the nutrient is in the soil in the right balance with the right balance of the other nutrients so that weather dependent uh the plant can release these nutrients at the right time for these plants to take them up okay so the coefficient of diffusion is just you know what does at element level have to be and the growing conditions I'm dealing with in Saskatchewan or Ontario, with the weather and the moisture that I have available, what is the coefficient of diffusion of that soil? So how do I measure that? <clears throat> Once we learn how to measure that in the soil, as a production agronomist, <clears throat> we now have a better understanding of what my yield potential is and where is my optimum level in that soil that I have to get to to make sure that with the weather and environment I have to deal with on the farm, too wet, too dry, whatever, I've got the right amount of these nutrients being released to that plant. And I'm not talking about nitrogen here, because that, that one's easy to put on. I'm talking about all the other nutrients. For proper nitrogen use, let's, let's put aside the, the microbes at present time. My nitrogen use efficiency goes up with the right level of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, and all the other nutrients in the soil. Uh, boron plays a big factor on nitrogen use efficiency. So when I have when I talk about balanced nu- nutrition, nitrogen is different because it's so easy to put on. But if I have low potassium and boron and magnesium levels in a field, I'll have to use 30 to 50 percent more nitrogen to get the same result. But the result might be in yield, but not in quality. So I might get as many bushels, but my nutrient density, my n- nutraceutical component of that crop I'm, I'm feeding is not nearly going to be of the quality that it would be if I had all these components put together, if that makes sense, okay? So we look at globally, and there's a lot of people talk about the foods that we eat today aren't as good as the foods that our, our grandparents had. Well, they had more of a holistic environment. They had animal manures, they limed, they just had a better, a better balance of nutrition that they, they grew these, these foods with. Um, and that's the balanced fertility thing. So... I don't know if that I explained that right or not. That but. explains it perfectly. Now, 
go, going from there, how do, okay, so I'm a producer in Western Canada listening to this. Great. Okay. I know if I get some of my other nutrients more balanced, my nitrogen is going to be more efficient, better quality, better yield, better human health, all that good stuff long-term. How do I go achieve it, achieving that? What amount of, of, of practical steps in terms of say soil testing, tissue testing, soil health tests, all, all of the tools that you work with producers on a practical level, how do you start to get there? Well, you talked about the seminars that you, that you were watching, the ones that we did virtually. I mean, since I started this company, um, one of the big things we did was let's teach the, the farmers how to use the information. There, if you take two agronomists and put them in a room together, you'll get four different recommendations. So <laughs> right? There's more. Why is that, Greg? Well, that, what, that, what? that's because there's more than one way to do it. Um, I tell farmers that don't understand where their optimum level should be. Uh, we have charts and tables you can follow. But I say, just go out in the field where you've got really strong production and lower production. Take a soil test of the two areas and compare them. And then you have to understand how I can build that soil level up in the poor area to match the good area. So um, in our seminars, we kind of try to dispel the myth of whose recommendations are right or wrong, because there's no such thing as a wrong recommendation. The recommendation that you put together is based on understanding, first of all, what can I afford to do and how do I budget that in? How much money is it going to cost me to produce a crop? So what's the removal per bushel for the crop I'm producing? So that's where we start with the economics. And then we look at, in this field, I've got these lower producing areas and I have these higher producing areas. And ideally, I'm making more money in the higher producing areas. So how do I, how do I develop a fertility program to get the low producing areas to match the high producing areas. And other than structural drainage and compaction stuff, I'm talking about just nutrient base. And then we teach farmers, agronomists, retail people in our seminars, how to, how to make those calculations. Um, you know, charts are fine, but every soil is different. So how do I take this particular soil with this particular uh, mineral content and I'm looking at the coefficient of diffusion, in other words, how these, where I have to be to release these nutrients, and we teach people on how to do the math to get there. Well, farmers want to make their, their fields all very productive, so they want to get there as fast as they can, but the economics might not be there. So on our recommendations, we have what I classify as a very conservative build program that will get you from a medium level to a good level in three to five years. But a lot of farmers say, well, I want to get from the low level to the good level tomorrow. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, we tell them that's not probably the best approach. But uh, what can you afford? And then let's, let's start looking at you know, how we can apply these nutrients to build these soil levels up where we're not going to cause problems, but we're going to get to where we want to be. So we, we build in a, a build program. <clears throat> and then we look at the economics of doing that. So let's say my build program is having him put on 200 of pot, pounds of potash, let's say, in a season. And he said, well, I really can't afford that. I said, okay, put on 100. It's just just how long do you want to amortize this growth of that farm or that fertility over time, knowing that when you get there, your productivity is going to increase. Your nitrogen use efficiency is going to go up. So your cost of production is going to go down um, per unit. So it, it's all about the economics on a farm, uh, how we can do that realistically. And first of all, what do we, what do we establish as the goal? Where, where, where do we want to get to, if that makes sense to you? Um, all soils are not the same. Uh, every soil takes different, a different strategy to build them to where you want to be. And, and then the, the farm economics comes into play. But when I look at putting a fertilizer program together, I say, okay, this is, this is for growing the crop. Uh, this recommendation here is, is an investment in the farm. Just like you would tile a farm or lime a farm, this is an investment on building that level up so I've got, I've got productivity. Because those fields that have the better nutrient balance, even in a bad year, are more productive. And the lower the fertility, you get whacked in a bad year, a dry year or wet year or just, you know, environment. Mother Nature's against you. You just get whacked. But if you have a well-balanced soil with the proper balance, now, I'm not saying just go berserk. You need, we need to be within a, a window because too much is as bad as too little. 
um, when you get there, you've got a you've got a field that will will weather the storm. It'll be there uh, in good years and bad years. It'll mature on time. It will it will survive more frost. Um, it's just a field that performs year over year. If that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, are we collecting enough data? Are we collecting enough of the right data? Is there a big gap there? What would you suggest to to the average producer right now? Far- farmers today are are starting to think it different. I mean, um, we we recommend site specific sampling, and a farmer will come to me and they'll look at they've been doing a bulk sample, and to me, a, a bulk sample is an average of absolutely nothing on that farm. Um, Farmers have been doing it in the past just because they want somebody to give them a recommendation. Well, that really, I have a lot of guys that take a, a soil test like that, and they, they take it to this fertilizer dealer, and they, they get a recommendation from us, and they take it to this fertilizer dealer, and they get three different recommendations. So they add them together and, get together and divide by three, and that's what they use. <laughs> um, not a I bad strategy, it. but they should, they should, rather than that, they should be able to understand the data on the page and come up with what they understand is one, what they can afford to do and what they know works and then come up with a recommendation. So it's understanding the data. So we're recommending people do a site specific sample and yes, it's more samples per, per, per field, but it, it paints a picture and I, ca- I tell farmer, you're doing an audit of the variability. Now you could go back in the next year and just soil samples strategic spots because you now have them geo-referenced and just use one or two samples as your guide. Um, to, to reduce the cost of sampling. I've never had a farmer do that because once they understand, because we produce these maps that are very intuitive um, that show them, you know, what the deficiencies are and why, they explain, they explain it a little, a little clearer. Um, they've, they've always come back and said, no, I want to do more. Um, you, you did a good job sampling that field, but you've missed this spot here or this spot here, and I want to fill in the holes because this, this information is valuable to you. Once they learn how to read it, but most farmers, even a lot of retail, retail people, do not know how to explain a soil sample to get the end result. So in our seminars and in what we do, um, we, try to, we try to lay the information out in a, in our, if you look at our maps, in a picture format so that one of those maps looks like that field from the tractor seat. And once the farmer sees that, they, they understand what you're trying to do. What I say to most people when we talk about what we're trying to do with our soil sample interpretation is farmers inherently know all the bad spots in the field. They know they're there, and in some cases they know why they're there subconsciously. <clears throat> and all we're trying to do is, is bring that subconscious awareness of their production system to a, a conscious level. And once they get to that point, um, they understand it and they know how to fix it, and, and they're on track. So somebody's not going to sell them a bill of goods. They say, no, I can see it here. I can see what's going on here. And it's, it's pretty simple to understand that if I get this particular nutrient to where it, it is in this good producing area, things turn around because that's what I see as the, the big, the big uh, underlying problem for that, that particular production zone. So, again, it's, it's more about... And that's kind of where ANL Canada started. We started as a as a lab that worked on research projects to define production issues for farmers. We started with potatoes. My my partners were potato growers, and and when we put the company together called Crop Tech Laboratories, it was it was just basically a, a research based company that would go into production situations with farmers and just look at what was going on and see if we couldn't come up with some kind of logical solution to to correcting a problem or improving the condition. So it, it's more about using the information and laying the information out so that it, it makes sense to the producer because the best consultant you'll ever have on your farm is yourself because you're there every day. Um, you hire a consultant and it's going to take you a couple of years to educate him um, because he has, to, he has to pull out of you the knowledge you have of your own farm, if that makes sense. Um, so I tell farmers that what we were trying to do is, is help you understand what you're looking at so that you can make logical decisions uh, with the inputs that you're, you're, you're paying for to improve, if that makes sense at all. 
This is a fascinating conversation because you talk about the degree of complexity, even for something that I guess you could say as simple as a soil test and you have three different consultants and they all have different opinions as well as, you know, what you might read on in the Western producer. And then you go to coffee row and you're really confused. And then we're supposed to go from good old MPKS to, whoa, there's a plethora of, of, of life in the soil and it has tremendous impacts on and all kinds of things that are relevant to to my bottom line so how do you go from okay we should look at soil tests we should look at tissue tests we should have balanced fertility to we want to foster the right kind of good guys in our in our soil so that we can see the benefits uh and, and, and perhaps not completely replace but augment supplement supplant some of the synthetic chemical uh powerful and yet um Sometimes, you know, these, these, these chemical solutions come with adverse consequences to, to the ease and simplicity with which they, they increase yield. How do you make that leap in complexity from good old minerals to, to the microorganisms in the soil and how to harness them as workhorses? Well, let, let's, let's, let's dispel the myth about farmers are destroying the environment. Let's just dispel Perfect. the myth that's that we're putting all kinds of chemicals on because <laughs> um i don't care and the plant doesn't care if if that uh nutrient comes from a cow turd or the back of a fertilizer spreader it's plant food okay um how we put it on is important that we don't waste it because we are losing some of these reserves worldwide and how we put it on is important for plant uptake so let, let's just let's get rid of that we can we can activate these soil microbes to do a better job in helping the plant uh, pr prevent disease and overcome disease. And diseases are there. They're, it shows you spatial variability that exists in the field because most plants have an immune, immune system like you and I, and they're not going to get that disease if they're healthy. Uh, but I don't want to get rid of the pesticides we have because I'm a, I'm a person, and, and if I get sick, I'm going to go to the doctor and I get an antibiotic or something because, you know, I need it. It's not because... Um, I'm a terrible person. I, I'm just abusing myself. It's the fact that I'm in an environment <laughs> where I get stuff, okay? <laughs> Plants get it too. And we have, yeah. we have uh, synthetic products like pesticides and fungicides and insecticides that help us through those, those, those things. Um, what we're doing wrong in production agriculture is we're abusing the use of them because we're not helping the plant help itself. And if we have a be do a better job with plant nutrition and we – improve the soil health, and we get the whole system working, both plant and soil and microbes, to help support and suppress some of these things like insects and disease, the pesticides we have available to us today will last longer. Um, we won't create a, a situation in the, in the environment where um, diseases or insects become um, resistant to them because we're using them when we need to and not when we don't. So we're doing ourselves a big injustice. And again, I'm not against these tools we have because we need them. Because quite honestly, I don't know if you've hired a person today, but you're not going to get enough people on this planet to hoe a field. Um, so we have to have these products. <laughs> I mean, it's just not going to happen. So right. as we have to be more sustainable, we need all the tools in our toolbox to get it done. And we have to understand where, they, where they're needed. And we have to understand what can we do practically to improve that whole system so that our reliance isn't heavily one way or the other. Paint us a picture of where we are in the spectrum of history. Uh, you talked about a time when people didn't know there was biology in the soil. Um, you know, some of these things have been sort of disputed and our understanding has grown and waned throughout the years. But where are we with our current understanding of what's actually going on in the soil? Because some of the interactions you talk about are so complicated. It's hard for the average person to even follow let alone make use of. And how are you bringing together things like imagery and being able to, you know, map the genetics of, of the biome and the soil? Where are, we, where are we going with all this? And where are we in the scope of history? Well, we're, we're, we're at the very edge of the tip of the iceberg. Um, the, more, the more we learn, the less we know. So every time... That's a bugger, eh? <laughs> it, yeah, every time we think we've got a solution, <laughs> something else shows up. So, you know, we, we, we've got to take the blinders off and keep our eyes wide open because my dad told me one time, says, if you don't learn something in, in farming this year, you better quit because you're not paying attention. 
Uh, mother, <laughs> mother nature is a great teacher. And if you're paying yeah. attention, you'll, you'll, you'll see something happen every year that you might not understand, but if you look deep enough, you'll, we can figure it out. So um, where are we going? How do we fight, figure this out? We just got to keep looking and trying to pull it, pull it apart and figure out why ask the question why ANL Canada started as crop tech laboratories with a group of farmers again that were tired of waiting for solutions they were tired of somebody uh right to write waiting for a person to write a journal to come up with the solutions on their farm and half the times those solutions didn't work um they worked one place but not the other so we started working with farmer groups and we sit them down in a room and say, okay, what is the problem we're looking at here? How can we resolve that? Is it scab? Is it storability? Uh, is it how the potato fries? Uh, all these things. And we just put it to the task. We had we had um, people in the industry say, well, we've got this, this stuff in a jug here that will help you out. And we take their products and put them in the field side by side and just see if they worked or didn't work. So our we had no biases in the research that we did. Uh, we put it to the test, and if we if we designed a project, um, a research project with a certain hypothesis, and in the first year it didn't work the way we expected it to, rather than just try to do it again to make it work, we would sit back and say, okay, why didn't that work? How are we going to change this project next year to overcome some of these things that we didn't see happen? Why did why didn't they happen the way we expected to? them to so we just evolved from there it was first potato growers then apple growers and it just year over year over year it was a different grower group that came to us and said we need to know why this is happening i mean we're told to use this we're told not to use this um and that you know our projects today we've got a number of projects in field with growers uh looking at everything from storage quality of fruit to um to how, how a tree survives the winter and, you know, where does it have to be in nutrient status, even in the wood, to give us the crop we're looking for next year to deliver the fruit that we're, we, we, we need to have on this shelf. So it, it's about looking into realistic production um, situations. And we do a lot of field research ourselves, like we're doing in biologicals. We do a lot of field research. Uh, right now we're doing a research project with our our Sovita test and using radar satellite imaging for soil moisture, trying to come up with uh, a model that tells us that at a certain soil moisture, um, my rhizob my my microbiology biology in the soil is is, is being suppressed because microbes need moisture to to perform. Um, and you know what is that going to? How is that going to impact my mineralizable nitrogen? How can I regulate that? And where we're going with this using these satellites is that we would like to put a tool in place where farmers have the right understanding of that soil and what moisture it has to be at to, to retain the microbial activity to make it productive. So hopefully it would be better information on, on when should I take water? When should I irrigate? I mean, what gives me the right to take water? Cause the next, the next um, natural resource that we have world limiting is going to be water. I mean, we've already seen it in some places around the globe that water is a real factor. So that's the type of things we look at. And we're looking at practical solutions in production agriculture where we can maximize the, the efficiency of the resources we have presently. And how do we in, improve nutrient density in the crops that we're feeding? Um, it's all part of sustainability in agriculture. And if we don't pay attention to all these things on a more holistic basis, um, we're going to get blindsided with major food shortages, and we already are. So I, I kind of digressed here a little bit, but you asked. No, about, I think that's a very interesting thing, and I mean, there's so many different areas that I want to delve into, and I, I can tell you, I think there's going to be a, a part one and a part two, two to this, just for for time and attention spans. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I guess. Let, let me let me give you an example yeah. of something that we've yeah. completely overlooked when you talk about the microbiome and biology. I have um, a lot of people tell me that we don't need certain micronutrients, boron particularly. Boron deficiency is is across Canada is the worst deficiency we have bar none. We're not using enough of it. It has a big impact on yield. It has a big impact on nitrogen use efficiency. But what we've found out recently 
is that boron is a key component of the physiology of the microbes we're talking about. They need a certain amount of boron to just be functional. Um, we know that we have to have certain boron levels in a, in a soil right now to stimulate the microbes in the soil to break down residual herbicides that are causing us a lot of problem with some of these other microbes that are producing the antibiotics to, to help a plant fight diseases like Don. Um, so there's, you, t you look at what can we do next? We need to get a better understanding of, of all the nutrients that, are, that we need and know that are essential to plants and how it interacts not only to plant quality and yield and performance, but in this case, boron, which everybody pushes back on because everybody's afraid of it. Um, and we need, to, we need to open our eyes. How much is real? How much? And if you look at my boron presentation and that one se seminar I have, I talk about the research we've done and where we have to be and the microbial interactions of boron and, and how it improves nitrogen use and, and all that good stuff. Why are people afraid of boron? Wrong information. First of all, when we used to put boron on, it was a 90% a, a product. And to put a pound or a pound and a half on a field, we had no distribution, so we didn't get the responses we were looking for. Uh, or if we put enough on, uh, because of the concentration and didn't get distribution, it was toxic to plants. So everybody, it was just about products we had available and, and, and how it was used. And if we used it wrong way, it actually caused more harm than good. Um, but understanding that and understanding with the products we have today particularly, we don't have those issues. Um, we get better distribution uh, of the material. And we now use levels and applications of boron a lot of crops that a lot of the so-called experts would tell us would be absolutely a no-no and toxic to the environment or the plant, uh, which is not the case. I, I just use that as an example because it's a, it's a something we've been working on lately uh, where we see it as a big factor in nitrogen use efficiency, phosphate uptake, and, and ATP production within the plant, uh, certain disease suppression, and again, this, this whole thing about um, we got certain residual chemistries in our fields that we can't get rid of, a lot of group twos that cause damage year over year, and boron plays a major role in those microbes that break those down. And we, we've, been, we've tried to culture those microbes so we can put them as a bug in a jug and apply them in a the field to break these things down. <laughs> right. We, we can't culture them, but we know how to stimulate them. And, you know, we've taken soils where we've we've got this this happening when we apply a, a pesticide at high concentrations to it within three weeks it's broken down where the field wait a minute you said you can't cultivate them you can only stimulate them yeah we can't see when you look at microbes and taking microbes out of a soil or of anything you plate it out and you grow it okay so you you, you figure out what the microbe is you capture it if you want to use a term and then you plate it out and you grow it we have not been able to capture this bug and plate it out and grow it. Uh, and, and that's the case of a lot of bugs. So we know it exists because we know we see it, we see it, how it responds in certain soils. And we know how we can stimulate it, but we can't, we can't put it in a jug like we'd like to. Have others done so then where, where you might have failed? I mean, because there's this whole industry around, hey, we've got this bug in a jug and it's either alive bacteria or it's uh something that feeds the bacteria like a biostimulant how do farmers even begin to make sense of the 30 booths and a certain wing of all the modern day trade shows that are pitching two to five to ten bushels and 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 you know okay let, let, um, let's speak to that just a little bit because we're also producing bugs in a jug so we've got 4,500 different bugs but we know what they can do and we can put them in a jug and we can we can give them to a, a farmer and they stimulate productivity, they reduce disease, they enhance all kinds of great, wide, wild, wonderful things. But what you got to realize is these bugs in a jug that we see in the marketplace today are indigenous. They're already in the soil. So why aren't they doing what they're supposed to do? I had And why would I want to pay somebody to put more of them in there? Well, let me, let me speak to that. So I had one company that was putting bugs in a jug and they had a bunch of research projects out in this is out in, in Saskatchewan in Alberta. And they had success in some of their plots and some of their plots they, they didn't. So I was speaking out there at the time. I said, can I just speak to that for a minute? 
I said, I bet I can predict the fields that you had success in. And he, he kind of <laughs> looked at me like I was, I was nuts. And I said, I bet right. you had success in about 20 to 25% of your fields. And I bet they are the most productive fields already. And they said, yeah. Well, think about that. These are already indigenous bugs. Plants cultivate them, but they need the right nutrition to cultivate them. So if we're going to use bugs in a jug, and they are going to be very beneficial production agriculture because we can't get there fast enough. But if we inoculate a rhizosphere with these organisms, we better provide the foodstuffs for that plant to cultivate them, or you're going to see uh, the, the application of those bugs, you're going to see a green up for the first month, but it's not going to go to yield. Because the plant, ca can't, the plant can't provide the foodstuff to keep those bugs alive in the rhizosphere. And those bad guys I talked about before will come up, come in and eat up all the goodies and compete with these bugs that you just, you've just inoculated in that rhizosphere. So we have to change the paradigm on a farm if we're going to start going to these, this technology. And we will because it, it does work. But if I'm going to start using biologicals to enhance my, my microbial activity in my rhizosphere, I better make sure that I'm putting a fertility program together to feed that plant so that plant can then exude the nutrients from the, from, the, from the root that feeds these organisms. What people don't understand is that the plant spends a lot of energy that it, it, it produces in, photo, in photosynthesis to feed this rhizosphere. Anywhere from 20 to 60% of the photosynthates a plant produces ends up in a rhizosphere to feed these bugs. The carbon the bugs are feeding on is coming from the plant. And we miss that. So this relationship between the plant and its own gut is and feeding these bugs is part of that whole holistic system that we need to understand what we can do to help the plant cultivate a healthy rhizosphere. I think this is an incredibly important point because I think a lot of producers experiences they hear about something and they want to suspend disbelief and they ask their agronomist and they ask their retailer and they might try something and at the end of the day there's there's frustration and almost the uh you know embarrassment of trying something that maybe didn't work i mean let's face it everybody's looking over the fence at what their neighbor's doing right so we put a bu bunch of bugs on there and have anticipation of success and it doesn't work um that really detracts from farmers willingness and, and wantingness to to try out different things. But I'll give you an example on our farm where we had tried out some, some bacterial products and we really didn't see any benefit. So our theory was that, well, you know, my, obviously, you know, Terry's been doing pretty strong, aggressive fertility package, worked with AgriTrend for a decade and a half type thing, you know, applied a lot of different products and, and different fertility and been measuring things for a long time. Maybe our soils are just, already really good and we have good biological activity and we putting on more doesn't really make a difference but you're saying that um our assumption that if a soil is poor has poor production won't have lots of biology you won't see as much benefit by putting that biology on those soils where we in my mind it's like okay let's put on the biology so we can bridge the gap versus the high productive high producing soils you're saying it's the high producing soils that you would predict uh, having 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 a, a net benefit too. Yes. Is that, is that true? Yes. But you know that doesn't mean that we don't address. So you've got a you've got a you've got a level of of bugs in your soil that's below where you want to be. So we inoculate and we bring it up. And everybody? Knock. Are you saying everybody? No. Or, or no. Is... There's there's some fields out there in very good shape. If you look at our soil okay. test where we do we give you a soil health index. If you get your soil health index over 40, our, our soil health index goes from, goes from zero to 60. Um, you, you, once you get over 40, you've got a system that's actually starting to, to build its own uh, microbial profile. And it, it, it's very sustainable. And we can inoculate that, and it, 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 will, it will bring it up even a, a bigger notch, but you've got a fertility system that's going to maintain that population. Whereas if you're down around 30, it doesn't matter what you put on that field. You're, you're going to lose that inoculation because, again, the bugs that you've, they've put in the jug, they've selected to do a certain thing, and they don't like that very, very diverse population because there's too many competitors, and they can't do their thing, 
and they will not end up in the rhizosphere because that neighborhood's already crowded. So as we get our soil health index over 40, what happens is the plant starts to bring in, and what we've seen it, what we seem to think it is, high concentrations of a bacillus that's toxic and deadly to some of these other organisms, and it kills off all the freeloaders. And then once they're gone, it changes the diversity of that population in the rhizosphere to something that the plant can manage and feed. And then we see the good bugs like Pseudomonas and Rhizobium and the nitrogen fixtures start to populate that neighborhood. And the bacillus population that the plant elevated for a short period of time drops down to a, a sustainable level, and I call them the policemen. They just keep, they just keep the neighborhood safe. Uh, but it allows room for these... Uh, Pseudomonas is one of the most aggressive uh, phosphate solubilizers, antibiotic producers we have, and a real friend of the plant. Uh, but it's a weak sister. It doesn't like anybody in the neighborhood that's going to cause it grief. It wants a five-star. It wants to stay in a five-star. So we have to really clean up conditions in the neighborhood for Pseudomonas to, to play, if, if that makes sense to you. So um, we, in, in the work we've done and we've watched, these, we've watched this transition and we look at measuring that soil health profile, uh, we know who's going to be active in that rhizosphere based on, on some of the things. The, there's 487 um, factors that goes in our algorithm for soil health. And when we first, we, we first saw that, we measured that we, um, back a few years ago here, George is looking at the data. And I just saw this, this amazing look come across his face because, like I said earlier, he's been looking for that holy grail, that disease-suppressive soil. And he said, you guys have just discovered the disease-suppressive soil. There it is, right there. So we know what it takes to get there at this point. I mean, we're going to get – Mother Nature is going to teach us some more yet. But <laughs> we, we, we've got a pretty good idea of when this, these microbes start to become active. And we know as we go into this biological um, era, era that we have, to, we have to change the way we address plant nutrition to make sure as we use these biologicals, we're giving it the food and the resources to do what it does. So let's say I use bugs in a jug and I got a poor producing field and I inoculate that rhizosphere. If I also pay attention to the nutrient status of that plant through the growing season to make sure it doesn't come up with a shortage, I can maintain that population and likely get a response, maybe not as good as a healthier soil, but I can get a, a response to the application. If I just put the bugs in the jug on and expect them to do the job, it's not going to happen. They're, it's going to pretty that plant up for about a month, and then things are just going to collapse. How many farms are over 40? What province? <laughs> Who are going to pick on somebody now? Well, I obviously, I mean, we're from Western Canada. I'd be very interested to know in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Well, I, and and there's 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 still lots in in Western Canada that are over forty. Uh, matter of fact, the highest one I've ever seen so far from on a soil health test comes from Peace a Peace River area. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So it, it's it's not like the West is is worse than the East. It's just that you've got a much larger land base um, that has a lot of work to do. Whereas, you know, in eastern Canada, we have to make do with 100 acres where you guys just go buy another 1,000 and another two sections. <laughs> uh, hey, it's a competition. Everything's in light. You, you, don't, you watch nature. You know these little guys in the soil even are competing. So this is, we, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, we it's okay. Compete. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay to compete. Yep. Um, so beyond boron then, I was going to ask you, and you, you already answered my question in some ways, but. So maybe is boron the number one concern in Western Canada for a nutrient? And where would you go? What would be the next top? No, like they, what are the top they, three they, concerns? They all are. I mean, um, everybody thinks that Western Canada is high calcareous soils. That's just wrong. You've got lots of fields that need to be lined. Uh, you've got a problem. Can in, you define high calcareous for High for calcareous myself? means oh, okay. I would call classify as over 95% saturation of calcium. Uh, you have okay. some of those, but you have a lot of soils. And this is another misnomer a lot of people have when they look at fertility and need for lime. You look at a need for lime in a field, let's say in Alberta, as having a pH of 7, 8, as needs no lime. But that pH is being held up there because you've got, 
you got 37% saturation of magnesium. It's a magnesium keeping the pH up there, not the calcium. And that's why farmers in Western Canada that grow in canola have club root. And when people tell them it's a, it's a calcium-related thing, they say, no, I've got all kinds of calcium. My pH is 7, 8. No. When you look at the availability of that calcium, it's not available because the magnesium's keeping it unavailable. And that's why you have club root in these high pH soils. So mm-hmm. it, it's not just one nutrient. I, I picked on boron because that's one that's really standing out. You've got, you've got calcium problems in parts of Alberta but that's causing issues with canola. You've got excessive magnesium and you've got deficient magnesium. You've got uh, high levels of potassium but low potassium availability because of, because of the clay structures that you're dealing with. So it's not just one element. It's understanding the, the soil chemistry and how to balance that chemistry, and it's not just one element. You've got manganese issues. You've got molybdenum issues. I mean, we've, one size doesn't fit all in this, in this production system. We need to identify what the limiting factors are. And, yes, you might have a boron deficiency in a field, but you've got severe potassium deficiencies, and that's a bigger fish to fry than boron. Because if, if your potash level, one of the major nutrients, is, is really deficient, Going out spending dollars on, on boron is not the case, if, is not the answer. If you have a, a high magnesium situation, um, you need to get rid of that. You need to figure out how to bring that down. So you, know, you need to spend money in line before you start worrying about boron and manganese and zinc and all those things. So we need to identify what is the most limiting factor. And in our Terracite program, we graph this out. So we graph out all the nutrients, and we do this using satellite imagery or drones or even yield monitors on combines, and we have a summary graph on the front page that, that takes every nutrient and it, it rates it based on its impact on yield performance from the best nutrient to the worst. So, and then we have a kind of a, uh, a table where it says, under, the, under this line, you need to address these first and start with the worst. So it might be phosphorus, it might be potassium, it might be magnesium, but we classify them as, as we see them from this imagery on how they infect um, biomass production. And then we say, okay, uh, hopefully that gives the farmer a visual interpretation. Okay, where do I start? And so that's one technology we're using that's new. Uh, We're just basically introducing it now. Uh, But it's, again, this graphic um, interpretation of how your field's producing from a satellite image, your combine, or a drone. So anything that gives us uh, biomass interpretation. Then we built these algorithms based on your soil test information. And then the, the judge here, the person that's telling us, you know, which one to pay attention is Mother Nature. So Mother Nature says in this field, you've got this type of productivity and this is your best yield and this is where your nutrient level is. So Mother Nature is the one telling us. So I, I don't care how good you are as an agronomist. I don't care what extension office you come from. Mother Nature is saying, hey, this is reality. So, again, one of those tools that we've created to help farmers get a visual interpretation of what's really happened on their farm um, so that they can focus on, you know, where are they going to put their dollars. When I listen to you, I hear you when you say, and it really resonates, the more that we learn, the less that we know. And when you're talking about fixing issues or addressing issues or deficiencies, is it that the, in a way, the more that you adjust or fix or compensate for one area, then the more these other deficiencies will be apparent and need to be addressed or Liebig's law. And where is the distribution curve of economics and stress about what I need to fix and time and energy versus just pouring on the coal and getting your results? Well, again, just pouring on the coal, as you put it, can create all kinds of imbalances. (laughs) So let's say I've identified or somebody's convinced me I have a serious, serious potassium problem. And I just start dumping potash on it. Now I've messed up magnesium. I've messed up calcium, all kinds of other things. So we just can't do that. We've got to look at the relationship. And and on our soil information, we have ratios like K to magnesium ratios. We have calcium to magnesium ratios that you have to work within. So that when we make a recommendation say, if you're going to do this, You've got to do this too, or, or you're just going to create other problems. And the problem with that is we just pour on the coal. We do something, and I've heard farmers say, I tried that once. It didn't work. Well, you tried it, but you created your own problem. 
if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about some of the key nutrients just as we go. Um, maybe we can address the, the four big, big ones. Cause I feel like if we can get those right, maybe we can go on to some of the finer points of the micronutrients, but, but in some cases you, I think you're making a case that we need to look at, uh, things on an individual basis it's just because they're needed in small quantities doesn't mean it's just as relevant or more but let's start with nitrogen where are we at today with nitrogen use in the world you know we got this war in europe they're shutting off the tap with natural gas to make make nitrogen you got countries where they're not allowed to use it um, they're finding more efficient ways to to convert uh urea from the atmosphere to to the granular that we use via the Haber-Bosch process. Um, it's on the radar in Western Canada. They spent millions of dollars in multi-provincial research to determine emissions. And they're now starting to, I guess, set goals or legislate around it. And, and folks say we're going to lose billions of dollars, like nitrogen. T talk to me about nitrogen. First of all, we want to be very careful in, in, in North America that we don't, we don't go the same way they did in, in Europe. We don't want to be regulated to the fertilizer use because it's not going to do anything for production agriculture. It won't be sustainable. Um, we're not in a position where our government's going to subsidize our farmers because we're told we have to cut back where they are in Europe. Um, but we have a the, the, the reason why we can be picked on is because we have a real love affair with nitrogen. The nitrogen we're applying today is not being used effectively. So we have to understand what nitrogen use efficiency is and how we can make the nitrogen we're using today um, more effective. In other words, balancing off even potassium. As I increase, I have a, I have a formula in one of our, we, we do a lot of work on nitrogen, VRT nitrogen applications. And I have formulas based around uh, potassium to magnesium ratios. And I, I can put on 30% less nitrogen and get the same result if my K to magnesium ratio is where it should be. If I'm that 0.25 to 0.35, I can use 30% 30, 30 less. If my, if my K to magnesium at, is at 0.15, I got to use 30 to 40% more nitrogen to get the same same effect. I won't get this. I might get a better, a better yield, but no quality, more disease, mm -hmm. and I don't have that yield potential I would have if that balance is where it should be. So um, when it comes to nitrogen, yes, we've got to be, very careful as a farming community that we don't get regulated because um, there's holes there's holes in our information on how we use nitrogen. We're not using it properly, but we're using it properly for all the knowledge we have as farmers. This is what we've been told to do. There's not enough research coming at us from research institutions that say this is how to use nitrogen and why. Uh, I see research all the time on fertilization, and it's all about nitrogen. It's not, how can I improve my nitrogen uptake if my potassium is with it? Or how can I improve my nitrogen yeah. uptake if I have a balance of calcium with it? I, we don't see that because we don't do fertility research from a holist, holistic perspective. When I do my research, I, I make sure there's no limiting factor. If I'm looking at an element, I make sure there's no limitation. I look at, you know, when you talk about Liebig's Law and Mulder's chart, I mean, I make sure that if I'm doing something here, uh, I'm getting a response because I've paid attention to the magnesium and the potassium and the calcium to make sure that I see the nitrogen response. <clears throat> we don't do that. We just put on 100, 150, 200 pounds of N. What's the other? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, so, and it, it could probably be uh, counterproductive at, at higher levels. Is it true that if you overstimulate certain microbes in the soil, they start to consume the carbon and you don't have your nitrogen to carbon ratios right and we're actually robbing? organic matter we break down organic matter seriously when we put too, too much nitrogen on but more importantly and i don't want this to be taken out of context by somebody uh, a lot of the microbes that we study that do a lot of good things for plants don't like high nitrogen they need nitrogen but they don't like excessive nitrogen so we put the excessive nitrogen on we really just we really disrupt that that gut of that plant is it like red bull for people because i like red bull <laughs> like the tall ones, sugar free when I'm on the road. Uh, but I'm like, that's probably not good for my biome. But man, do I feel good when I eat? Yeah, when I take it. That, when that, that would be a good analogy. It's like Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so phosphorus, uh, limited supply worldwide. Uh, 
it's very abundant in some areas of the world that maybe we don't want to be doing business with those folks. Uh, if you look from space, you can see the world's longest conveyor. It's 68 miles long in Morocco. That's, that's moving phosphorus, I guess, from wherever they mine it in the desert to the, to the ocean. But a lot of production is now in uh, Florida, but people don't like giant gaping open holes in, in planet earth that uh, they consider to be, you know, polluting or whatever. And so you, you put this rock foss into a hundred million dollar plant or 150 now with inflation, you use sulfuric acid to strip out the map, map the, the, the phosphorus molecule, molecule to make it available for plants, but it gets tied up when it goes back into the soil. And then you have all these people saying, well, my FOSS molecule is more available than yours. And it's liberated by such and such proprietary technology, put it in your tank, put it in your soil yada, yada, yada. But phosphorus seems one of the most elusive things. Uh, prices through the roof. Um, how do you make it available? What form do you put it on? Are we running out? Uh, is it the biggest concern? Uh, phosphorus. Our, uh, first of all, every living organism on this plant needs phosphorus to survive. All the microbes we talk about, their main goal in life is producing, converting organic phosphate into ATP. So without phosphorus, we all die. Keep that in mind. Oh, wow, that's morbid. <laughs> that fact, without phosphorus, we're, we, we don't exist. Every bug on this plant doesn't exist without phosphorus. So it is the energy drive of, of everything, everything in any, in, 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 to sustain life. Um, we, we were at our peak reserves in phosphate on the planet in 1988. So we're over the hump. We now have to be a little more proactive in the efficiency of use of phosphorus. Most plants, phosphorus use efficiency is less than 40%. Okay, so plants have a hard time getting phosphate out of the soil. I don't care how you put phosphate on. Microbes will break it down to make it available. Uh, it gets fixed in soils to iron, aluminum, uh, calcium. So that's, that's just natural uh, chemistry in soils. Um, we... We don't want to have too much phosphorus. You get too much phosphorus in your soil, it's not available to plants, just like all the other nutrients. So there's a there's a happy optimum level. If you look at our soil report, we have a we have a measurement for phosphorus availability on there called P saturation, and that's based on 18 years of research on understanding phosphate absorption and desorption from soils. We know based on soil chemistry, a range that you have to have our P saturation. I don't care how many part per million you got of an Olsen or bicarb or malic. I don't care what it is. The P saturation number is how much that plant can see. And I know for optimum productivity, I need my P saturation in this particular range for this soil type. Now, if it's below that, I'm not getting the uptake. I should, no matter what my PPM is, because I've got things tying it up. But if I get my P saturation too high, I now know I've got an environmental concern because it's desorbing and moving into, into the water course. So, and we, you know, every time we do research, we're just, we're just concerned about the environment as we are growing the crop because, um, and I think most farmers are. Farmers, if they have the information, they're not going to pollute. They, they, they want that farm to be pristine and be in the family for ever and ever and ever. So understanding phosphate, yes, we have a declining reserve available. Um, Phosphorus availability is not as complicated as people want to make it make it out to be. It does get fixed in soils based on iron and aluminum and calcium concentration, which we can measure. Um, how we place phosphorus is important because it doesn't move very far from, from where we place it. Um, but again, having, having phosphorus at that optimum level, optimum P saturation level, makes everything more productive. Less weed pressure, less insect, less disease pressure. Because again, with the right availability of phosphorus and every microbe we've talked about today, their main role in life is to convert phosphorus to ATP. Their main role in life is to provide good available phosphorus to plants. So all the microbes we talk about, to some degree, are phosphate solubilizers. That's what they do. Uh, so these bugs, they'll dissolve and they ingest phosphate and then the plant takes them up as endophytes and ingests them. Just for those people out there that are vegetarians, plants are meat eaters, just so you know. Okay. Um, oh, that is a trigger. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> that they, is a trigger. They, plants actually actually consume these microbes to ingest these nutrients they take up. And well, at least they're eating a meat eater. 
I mean, I hope that makes them feel better. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I just, I just, that's a little bit of fun. Oh, that's the, anyhow. Um, phosphorus is a concern, uh, but phosphorus availability is a concern. But again, another nutrient that globally um, governments like to regulate because of the overuse. And it ends up in waterways and yep. treats algae blooms and different things. Well, some, uh, some of those algae blooms are a little misunderstanding too. I bet. Because I bet it's a lot more complicated than it seems. Well, um, I, I hunt. I hunt in a place up north where there's no agriculture. There's no manure spread. There's no fertilizer <laughs> spread. And the year, yeah, of the, yeah. the big year of the big algae bloom, we saw that beautiful green algae bloom in rivers and ponds and lakes where I hunt. Um, but you got to realize that when when weeds decompose and break down and frost hits them in the fall, they release phosphates. Hmm. And decomposing, and you know, you look up, you look at a weed bed or a swamp, or like Lake Erie, where they say that big algae bloom is in, in the south of Lake Erie. If you took look, look at that algae bloom, and if you're a fisherman and you just drive around the edge of that, you'll know that in that part of Lake Erie is just one big marsh. The weeds are right to the surface in the summertime. And when the frost hits them and they decompose, all that phosphate those plants take up is being released in that decomp de decomposition. So it's not about, not about the phosphates flowing down the Maumee River. Uh, or it's not about even about the phosphates being reduced by local uh, cottages as much as it is a natural phenomenon from, from the plants that were in that, that region. Can I bring rock foss out of uh, Kappa's casing on a rail? And spread it on farmers' fields and get a result, or and or mix it with compost and elemental sulfur to make it more liberate that molecule. Rock rock phosphate, as you know, is where we get our phosphorus from. Once we once we break it down, if you if you machine it fine enough to what we call soft rock phosphate, it will be more available. But if you add sulfuric acids to it and and break it down to make it more available, it's more available. So yeah, you can use it, but just to spread rock phosphate on. Uh, it's going to take a long time for that to be available. Yeah. Oh, p potassium. I mean, my father, um, in the early days of the farm, went to work for 15 years at what is now the largest mine uh, in the world, regardless of what kind of mine it is. It's the largest underground mine in the world at Astrahazy. Um, we have tremendous potash reserves underneath our feet, and it's very fortuitous given what's going on in uh Ukraine and Russia and, and Europe, um, people say, well, we don't need potash because we got so much in our soils um, and yet not a lot of it's available. We know that if potassium is, is balanced in the plant, the, the, the plant roots will exude in such a way to actually access that potash. We looked at your data set over the entire span of Western Canada for a year and the tissue tests and 60% of those were deficient in K. And yes, we use a fair amount of here, but right now, I can tell you, it's getting railed all over the world to places like Brazil, where they've they're farming the the Amazon uh, rainforest, so to speak, where those soils are are essentially bereft of nutrients after year one and can't produce anything without potash. But this is the first thing that's getting cut right now in Western Canada. I'm personally dealing with this at a thousand bucks a ton. Uh, folks aren't as liable to to go on a good constructive building program like you talk about with balanced fertility. So where are we at with potash in Western Canada specifically? Well, po potassium is yield. It's not nitrogen, it's potassium. In early stages when you're developing your yield and crop, a plant needs three pounds of potash for every pound of nitrogen it takes up in early stages. It levels out at one-to-one -one in mid-season, but in the early stages it is number one, and that's where your yield determination com is coming from. The problem we have with soils, and we look at we look at people's interpretation of soil chemistry. Um, if you pick up fertilizer handbooks anywhere in North America, nowhere in those handbooks do they differentiate sands and clays for uh, fertilizer recommendations. And sands and clays, you're a farmer, you know, sands and clays are different. You walk across a field with a pair of boots on in the rainfall, you know the clays from the sands real quick. <laughs> so right. the mineralogy of those fields, those soils are different. So I may have 300 ppm of potash in some of the clays you've got in Western Canada. But when we look at the percent available potash, it's below the optimum percent. So in a dry condition, potash is just not available. Um, so when I look at, and a lot of people don't believe in base saturation, but base saturation of the cations is just a, a, a simplistic way of looking at coefficient of diffusion. 
I'll uh, give you an example. Let's say my base saturation of your soil is supposed to be 2 to 4% because it's a heavy clay. Even though I got two or 300 ppm of, of potassium in that soil, I might be only at 1% saturation. That means that if I have any dry weather or a bit of compaction, potash is not going to be available to that plant. Or if I'm looking for real high yields, I just will not have enough potassium being released in that soil at the right time uh, to grow a huge crop. As I move the base saturation from 1% to 2% or even 2.5%, my coefficient of diffusion, in other words, the predictable availability of potassium coming from that soil in even a drier weather condition, is going to be greater. So it's not about how many ppm you have. It's about that coefficient of diffusion I talked about very, very much earlier. And what is that soil's ability to to release potassium to the plant. And, and again, it's water and anion. So when we look at availability from water, uh, an ion is more available in water than it is on a soil. <clears throat> so I have water and lots of moisture. My availability uh, of that nutrient, even in a lower concentration, will be more available to a plant. But as I reduce the water availability and my ion concentration is lower, my availability is even lower. That's the, that's the premise of coefficient of diffusion. Base saturation is just a simple interpretation of that. So it says I've got so much of this ion in concentration on the soil particle, and at 1% saturation, yes, it's available if I've got lots of moisture. But as things dry out, or if my root system's bigger, I have a big crop demand, I may not get a pound or two pounds of potash per day released to that crop where I might need four pounds per day. But as I move my base saturation from 1% to 3%, I'll triple the pounds of potash available per day. And even in a more um, less, a less ideal environment like dry weather, I'm still getting more potassium released from that soil. So it's not about the part per million. It's about the mineralogy of the soil you've got and what is the optimum concentration of that ion on that soil, in this case potassium, to make it available to the plant or the, the ability for that, because these soils fix potassium. So what is their, what is their, um, um, what, what is the chance of them releasing that element at certain times to that plant as the plant grows? And again, as the plant goes into flowering, it has a bigger demand. Um, and we've got situations where growing corn in the States over 300, 400 bushel, well, it doesn't matter how high the potash content is in the soil, it can't deliver 15 pounds of potash per day. And that's what that crop needs. So we're going to start, start side dressing potassium on some of these high productive crops just to increase that availability, if, if, this make, if this makes sense to you. So it's more about understanding mineralogy of the soil and what is that optimum level in that soil type. Even though I've got 1 or 200 or 300 ppm of potassium, how much of that potassium is actually available to the plant when it needs it? <clears throat> Hmm. If that makes Fascinating sense. Stuff. Oh yeah, no, it's very interesting stuff. Sulfur uh, used to get a lot of it from the atmosphere. You're very well versed in that. I'd love if you spoke to that a little bit. But uh, sulfur it interacts with all the other nutrients on the Mulder chart in a positive way. I think uh, Mike Galinsky said maybe with the exception of molybdenum. Yeah, you can probably except for molybdenum. Is that, I got that right. Oh yeah. wow, I did remember something. Um, fascinating nutrient. I mean, we've been working with it for the last seven years. Um, even though sometimes our product still gets, uh, you know, uh, viewed as, as a snake oil, <laughs> but, but sulfur is a very, very interesting nutrient. The more you learn about it, like you say, the less, less, you know, um, where do you see sulfur in the, in the pantheon of, of nutrients that folks need in, in Western Canada? Well, it is, it is an essential element. And, you know, we used to be recognized as the breadbasket of the world and not so much anymore, because if you grow wheat, there's sulfur deficiency and we, and we um, mill that wheat. Uh, that wheat, because it's grown in sulfur deficiency, actually accumulates asparagine. And when you mill a crop with high asparagine, it converts to acrylamide. So we all of a sudden woke up a few years ago uh, at our government level, our extension level, saying that we need more sulfur, where they're always against sulfur because they said we got lots from the atmosphere. And if you look at the atmosphere de deposition of sulfur across Canada, you guys never got any of that free stuff. You don't have enough. Um, that's not right. We need to start an equalization program. Yeah, okay. That's right. 
Anyhow, um, <laughs> so we've done a lot of research on, on sulfur, and the old adage of sulfur levels in soils that a lot of labs use at 14 to 15 ppm as being lots and high is not the case, particularly near clays in Western Canada. Because the high, and this comes out of Teasdale and Beaton, it's not all my research, but there's charts in there that talk about the higher the carbonate concentration in your soils, the magnesium carbonates, calcium carbonates, and even potassium and aluminum, it's going to fix sulfur. Sulfur can be fixed. Uh, and you might need, instead of where we thought it was 14 or 15, you might need 30 and 40 ppm of sulfur in some of your clays. And we're nowhere as close to that. So you're always going to see a sulfur response in a lot of your clays in Western Canada. And it is a good guy. We need sulfur to make these nutrients available. Uh, we look at the uptake of nitrogen and phosphates, anions. The companion ion that they need to be taken up by the plant is hydrogen. And hydrogen is primarily produced by addition of sulfurs and acidification. Mm. Okay, so just to make the whole system work from a, from a plant physiology point of view, we need sulfur. And we're very much deficient in a lot of our soils in sulfur. If that makes sense. I think the the producer listening to this episode is starting to get, you know, the broad strokes here. And uh, at, at, on one hand, I think it's exhausting. On the other hand, it, it gives one hope. And it's an infinitely complex puzzle of which, you know, you can dedicate your life to growing better crops. And, and I think for producers, a lot of time, you know, money can become meaningless. I mean, unless you don't have any, then it's, then it's immediately painful, you know? Um, but if, if you're doing okay financially, I think, you know, we attach our, our uh, positive outcomes to really growing a good crop, but let's just break it down. Let's say that I'm a producer in Western Canada. I want to collect data. I want to get to this healthy balance and I want to promote my biome and I want to grow nutrient dense food. Tell me what kind of budget do I need? Who am I going to be working with? What do I look at on your tests? Uh, how do I actually go about executing this, Greg, uh, in the context of, of what you do for producers? Well, well, first of all, let me step back and give farmers credit where cre farmers, the credit is due. Um, there's a difference between farmer farming today and just being a tractor driver. A real farmer, it's it's an art. The, the art is because of the passion we have for farming. We're farming because we love the life and we're passionate about growing these crops. So the first thing I want to say to all farmers is if you're a farmer and you're there because you're passionate about farming, listen to your gut. Before you listen to every salesman coming up the farm to the farm gate, listen to your gut. You you subconsciously know what you need to do and know what's right. Then look towards help to gather the information that you require to interpret the information. Become your own consultant, I guess is what I'm saying. Use consultants. I'm not against consultants because I was one and I consult too still today to some degree. But be become, become your own consultant. Um, you need to understand to some degree or some level and follow your gut instinct of what you know should be right or wrong. because there's, there's some, and the things I think we've talked about today, I've talked about these microbes and stuff. And I, this, this is not, this is not rocket science. This is stuff that's really inherently basic, basic understanding of, of how things live on this planet Earth that we, we occupy. So understanding that just principle of growing a plant or a cow or a goat or a chicken. I mean, we all, even the people, we all have the same needs. So we first of all have to listen to our gut. And then there's lots of information, gather information, collect information. You, you, you got a consultant, have him collect the information so he can present it to you so you can make some sense of this. We have, um, we used to use Rockwell when we started with precision ag and mapping our fields. We developed our own mapping software because the Rockwell software was not, was, did not interpret levels. It showed variability, but it didn't tell a farmer anything about where is a good and produ bad production zone. So we, we try to paint the picture in as many different ways as we can so that farmers can look at that and say, that makes sense to me. So answer your question is farmers should look for information that they can use that when it's presented to them makes sense and it follows that gut in intuition they already have, if that, if that makes sense to you. So yeah, we, in terms of the economics, we have to invest to get this data. How, how would you coach that in terms of, uh, 
you know, the output of the yield and the value of the land and, and what you need to spend to get this data in terms of maybe time is, is a metric too, time and capital? First, first thing is in production agriculture is, is have, and it's not because I run a soil lab. I mean, soils was the worst course I ever took in university. I'm a plant physiologist, but I, I understood that I had to understand what was in the soil if I was going to understand how to grow a plant. So the first place a farmer has to look towards is have good, reliable soil test information that you can understand. And if you don't understand it, and it's it's not laid out so that you understand how it is based on your soil type, find somebody who can give you that interpretation. Uh, that's that's the foundation of what you're trying to do in farming. And then from there, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. We have selection of the right seed, and we can, we can spend a whole day talking about seed differences and things. But, um, yeah, it, it's an information-gathering process. And another thing we have to think about as is, is farmers, find a piece of software or some utility you can use to collect all this data because it's going to come to day where we're going to have to be able to justify right to farm uh, because these legislations are coming. And if we don't want our tools taken away from us, we better have the data that shows that I got response from this application. I know I have to be at this level of P, K, nitrogen use, and I know I'm not... I'm not losing it to groundwater um and i have to be able to prove that because somebody's going to stand up and say you don't know so i think you should use 50 percent less nitrogen right how do you see this regulatory environment going into a world which there's a fair amount of folks on planet earth are going to go fairly hungry this winter by a lot of accounts i i think we can do a better use of, with nit- a better job at nitrogen use Provided we're provided we're given the information on how to improve that efficiency, which it's there, but we've got too many people that are rallying against farming that all they want to do is cut, and they want you to provide the same quality of food at half the price, and they want you to use half your tools to do that. It's not sustainable. Hmm. And so, speaking of human consumption. Um we were discussing one of your passions is understanding the human biome and how it relates to soil. I'm sure as you learn more about both, it all intertwines. What is the net effect of having a good balanced fertility equals healthy soils equals healthy planet and healthy people? Well, as I said, everything we've done from day one is looking at better quality of crop and understanding the nutrient density and and enhancing the nutraceutical component of the food we produce. A lot of research we do is just in that. How does phosphorus and potassium affect the lycopene content of tomatoes? Um, if you read, if you go through my born my born presentation, I think it's in this presentation, there is good evidence uh, now in the medical world that says that we need to increase our born consumption because that's a big issue with Alzheimer's. Um, uh, born deficiency in, increases Alzheimer's in, in the planet. Uh, zinc deficiency, brain cancer, um, prostate cancer, uh, magnesium deficiency in the foods we eat, hypertension, um, 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 depression, all the things we've got, anxiety, increased anxiety from magnesium deficiency, and a lot of the crops we eat are magnesium deficient. So I, I can put a whole seminar on. I usually put some of these goodies in at the end of my nutrient presentations and I've talked with other other uh, researchers that's all they do is talk about nutrition that you are what you eat and we need to improve and enhance our food quality because as I said boron Alzheimer's how, how bad is Alzheimer's now in our population and mm-hmm. they've got direct correlation to boron nutrition and Alzheimer's okay so I'm shocked and awed by what you're saying here and and but I'm also hopeful that there's I can do something is it the foods that I eat and I try and measure that or you can get specific nutrients from, from that or just hope, hope like hell, you know, farmers are making things nutrient dense as they can afford to, or do I take supplements like we do for the crops? What, what's your approach, Greg, to living to 190? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'll tell you off camera what my idea is there, but anyhow, um, <laughs> I, no, I want to know. I, and now that you said that, the listener wants to know. I'm a, I mean, I'm a bit of a, a, a naturopath in the way I treat my own self. I eat a whole regimen of vitamins because I know what our crops don't have. Um, I just think globally, and when we when we put together fertility programs, our focus is not yield. Our focus is quality. 
Um, we do a lot of horticultural work. And if you don't have quality, you can't sell your crop. So as we improve how we produce a crop, as we improve our productivity, as we become uh, more consciously aware of nitrogen use efficiencies, we will increase our nutrient concentration in the foods we eat. So I think that there's a real change in direction at, uh, around the globe on how we, how we produce a crop. And we're, we're really moving towards making sure that the foods that we produce have that nutrient balance that I'm saying that a lot of our crops are lacking now. So the move's the right direction. We just have to be able to provide farmers with the right information. Farmers themselves know. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a farmer going to a grocery store, your wife's going to a grocery store, and she's looking at buying a tomato, she would really like to have the tomato out of your garden rather than that one that's on the shelf that come from a greenhouse. Because we know, as farmers, where the food quality is. So we have the information, and I think, you know, inherently we're all trying to do it the right way. Uh, we just have to have the tools and the information so we can do it the right way. We're never going to get it perfect. But I really do think our food quality, although a lot of people said it's gone downhill since our grandfather's times, I think our food quality is starting to take a turn. I think there's more emphasis on quality of food. Um, a lot of that's driven by shelf life. But I think we're, we're actually going the right direction. But, um, we've got foundations like the Bill Gates Foundation that their whole concern is about nutrient density in uh, some of these other countries. Um, I think we're going the right direction. It's not, it's not perfect yet, but we're living a lot longer too because we all do eat better and most of us eat better than a lot of people in the rest of the world because we're all way overweight. Um, so it's not so much the food quality <laughs> is, is, is the, the amount we eat that's our biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, I actually weighed myself this morning. I'm the highest I've ever been in my life, but um, still feeling pretty good. So how do you do that? We have tools to measure nutrients in the soil. We have tools to measure the biome um, in the soil, and you're helping producers with that. Um, how do I know that my foods are nutrient-dense? And how do I know you're talking about being a bit of a naturopath? How do I know what nutrients that I need to take to avoid Alzheimer's and depression and, and can't brain cancer? And impotence or whatever it is. And hopefully, there's one for impotence too. You know, if it just that would be a big seller. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's there's lots of lots of literature out there. There's a couple of books by uh, Bonnie Kaplan who wrote one called The Better Brain, which talks about uh, kid nutrition, like childhood nutrition more than anything, mm. on why we have the autism and, and ADHD we have, and how it's related to nutrition in children. Um, I got a book that I spoke at a conference not that long ago. Uh, that actually um, we talked about han animal nutrition and plant nutrition and human nutrition on magnesium. And there's a good uh, couple of good books on magnesium um, that talks about the right magnesium level you should have in your diet. And it's a lot, it's a lot higher than the RDA level that you would think. I mean, in that book, it talks about an active male who's doing, um, Sports and activities should be taking anywhere from four to four and a half milligrams per day per pound of body weight. And we're not taking nearly that amount. Um, you know, you have things like Charlie horses and you get you tw your eye twitches a little bit. That's magnesium deficiency. You have hi hypertension. That's magnesium deficiency. <laughs> wow. So there's, 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 lot, there's lots of information out there in nutrition if you're looking to find. And there's lots of crap, too. There's lots of people that are trying to sell you snake oils and stuff. But if you go to the right sources, there's really good information on, on some of these things that they're, they're finding out that are related to some of the issues we have globally. Well, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the carnivore diet, and I, I've tried it a little bit. Um, <laughs> no, you know, not... Uh, not for months and months or years and years like some of those folks. And I think some of those folks over time, they start introducing other things, but they talk about autoimmune diseases, which I have psoriasis since I was too incredibly severe, um, but I've never been able to quite um, master it through through diet. I believe it's possible. And there's lots of celiac in our family, but um, I actually take supplements that are a combination of bovine organs, like liver, kidney, spleen, all that stuff, right, for nutrients. And it, so this particular fellow is Paul Saladino, MD, big carnivore guy. And of course he's, you know, eliminating a lot of things from one's diet, but uh, he's saying that's really all you need is, is supplements. Um, where do you stand on, on a person's diet when it comes to meat versus um, plants? And also 
Why is it, just like you have three agronomists that are sort of getting decent results, but in completely different ways, why can't, why do you have some people, you know, making Netflix documentaries about being uh, superhumans on plants, and then you have other people that eat nothing but steak, and uh, they're living a perfect life too. What the hell is going on? Okay, there's, there's a good book you can you can probably get off Amazon called One Man's Food, and it was written a long time ago, but that guy talks about supplementation, uh, which gets more to the genetic base. If you're an A or AB blood type. Um, you could be a vegetarian and you actually have a problem eating too much red meat. Uh, mm-hmm. Fish and vegetables is what you should focus on. And if, if you don't pay attention to that, you're going to come, you're going to have all kinds of autoimmune diseases and problems. If you're a type O, you got to, you got to eat red meat. Um, if you're a type A, AB, uh, you can't do a lot of exercise because you have a high vibrational body. And this comes right out of his book and it's actually bad for you. But if you're a type O, you need to be active. So that book, I think you can pick it up online. Um, I keep referencing people and tell them go get it and buy it. You can buy it like for four bucks a used copy off of Amazon. But it's called One Man's Food. And it's a real interesting read because he, he talks about vitamin supplements in there and, and proper re- regiments. He talks about blood type and what vitamins different blood types should take and shouldn't take. He talks about foods. Um, and it was written a long time ago. Another book came out um, called Eat Right for Your Type which I believe is a takeoff of that book. But that book doesn't oh, really? talk about blood types and vitamin regiments and other things like the one man's food does. Really? Um, so that's a really good reference book. And here we're way off topic, uh, Dan. But <laughs> No, this is part of the topic because what are we trying to achieve here? Yeah. I mean, we forget why we're growing food. Yeah. It is for the sake and the health and the advancement of humanity. And just because you're in industrial agricultural production, does not remove you from the fact that the price of our product, the quality of our product, the logistics of our product, how much of our product gets thrown out of the grocery store, how that impacts people, our children, our children, how that impacts our children's health and how little focus there is in the medical community. And and the medical community has its place. They're going to fix you if you break something or if you're in a severe situation where you need antibiotics. I'm not against any of that. But when I go, when you go sit in the clinic today, are you seeing people that are taking care of their car, their one God-given vehicle they're given to drive uh, before they get to the oil change? When you're given the choice whether you drive a Greg, whether you drive a jalopy or a Ferrari, that's how you care for it. And and it, so it behooves us to know. And I've read that book, and I totally believe it. Eat right for your blood type. Exactly. I don't do, none of our family does well on grains. My niece has intense celiac. I have aunts and uncles, four, three or four aunts and uncles with celiac. And so I'm a typo. Physical exercise is, is critical and paramount for me to do very well with, with lifting weights and stuff like that and exercising and eating meat. And, and the more carbs and grains that I eat, the more I feel terrible, yep. you know? So I'm, I, I totally love that. Uh, Book, get the other book. I followed that. Get, get okay. Well, I can't believe there's a predecessor to that well, book well, that you're saying is even better. One man's food, and the other one you you would really <clears> like <throat> to get is uh, the Better Brain, and it's it's a twenty buck buy. It's 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 cheap. Because because help me out here because this is something that uh, is very personal. I'm sure there's lots of people out there too with autoimmune diseases, and I believe it's more common in today's world because of the amount of of processed foods that are yeah, out absolutely. there. And if you feed and if sugar. you feed someone, if, yeah, yeah, if you feed your your kids uh goldfish crackers right every day they're going to be they're going to be sick like they're going to thrive for a while they look kind of plump but they're going to get you know they're going to have oily greasy skin they're going to have sunken eyes they're going to have disease yeah. they're going to be listless they're going to be depressed well that that I mean, book, the not... better brain addresses a lot of that for for kids so if we're eating whole foods that that goes a long way yep. but here is it that when we don't have the proper health in our gut wall, leaky gut syndrome, and, and food is going through you, that wall that normally properly absorbs nutrients into our bloodstream in such a way that it's soluble, it's available to, it's got a lot like plants. Well, what happens if you don't have that proper wall, if you have holes in it, for whatever reason it's broken down, and then you have nu- uh, nutrients going unprocessed into your bloodstream, then your immune system goes, what in the heck is going on down there? We've got some free nutrients. We've got to attack them. Well, my understanding is that's a lot of where things like psoriasis comes from, 
a lot of these autoimmune dysfunction diseases that are incredibly complicated that have huge implications on people's health. Real problem with autoimmune diseases and leaky gut, as you just mentioned, to magnesium deficiency. Jesus. I did not know that. How much magnesium do you take a day? I have no idea. I eat a lot of steak. How much is in steak? A little bit. How much is in ribeye? <laughs> as much as you need. Well, how do I get it, man? I'm ta I'm taking bo like I said, I'm taking bovine uh, organs supplements. The only thing, although I look at your to supplements on the road here. I don't know how much you yeah. weigh, but you likely need about a thousand milligrams of magnesium a day. I'm two twenty eight and a half this morning. You're, which is you're, like, you're, wow. you're over. You need over because you say you lift weights and stuff. You you need about four to four and a half milligrams per pound of body weight. Four and a half milligrams per 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 what? Per pound of body weight. You're probably about twelve hundred milligrams. Well, and it's interesting too because you you look at the incidence of depression and anxiety and 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 it's just rampant and um, and, and miscarriages, big big issue with magnesium deficiency in women in miscarriages. Hmm, unbelievable. And so, are you are you uh, as concerned about fostering the biome and, and humanity as you are in the soil? Well, like I say we're doing work with the University of Western on their whole work on the human gut biome and the female biome. Um, and we're actually, there's, we were supposed to publish, publish a paper together before now. Their Western's asking us to do a joint paper on the relationship or the, the similarities between the human gut biome and the plant biome. Hmm. Have you ever heard of a company by the name of Biome? Biome with a B, yep. isn't Victor? Yeah. For whatever reason, I'm on my third package of sending away my a scoop of my poop and, and, and my blood which is very painful for me to break my get enough blood um intensely interested in this concept and would really like to see my results and i've done the 23 in me as well which is really interesting but that's reality is that we, we were yeah we were involved a little bit with that with the, the repopulating um and that whole thing <laughs> about um ingesting somebody else's properly balanced uh, bacteria um, they've got synthetic poop now, so now you're not eating poop. Are you poop. suggesting eating poop? That's what they were doing for a while to try to get people have celiac and, and IBS and stuff. They were actually, they are actually paying people to send them stool. That was the right balance for people that needed this. Now they've gone to a synthetic poop. Would awful. you make that into a, a cookie or a muffin or how would you? <laughs> I don't know how they kind did of it. delivery system are we talking? <laughs> poop, poop, poop. Poop, it was called poop back then. It was called repopulating. Oh uh, well, now we really got off topic. <laughs> yeah, well, but you got to wonder too. Back in the day, I mean, uh, I think a lot of that was a lot more. I, I don't know. That wasn't that was long ago. That, more, I mean. that work was well in, in, in early two thousands. I mean, that, a lot of that work. Now they've gone to a synthetic um, probiotic that you can take that does the same thing. This fascinating field, but I believe it, I believe it's such like when you think about the physical act of putting food into your mouth and it disappears and it becomes you and your whole being is being shaped from the genetic memory of what you should be. I mean, your father's nose is a genetic expression of the memory in the, in the, in the DNA and the cells, which is, has infinite uh, data storage capabilities. Well, it's even, um, it's even bigger than that. And one thing we did in our society when we started doing cesarean sections is we, we removed a lot of the, the transmission of the, the human biome and biologicals that we get from our mothers. And just being born down through the birth can canal, our mothers secreted all their biological being on us as babies. You carry that bacteria on your skin your whole life. You can't wash it off. So somebody who was born by cesarean section 10 years ago, let's say, lost all that. So some of those natural immunities and some of those natural protection your mother provided you with, they didn't have. Now, a cesarean section today, when you're born, they actually take and swab the, the vagina of the mother and rub that on the, the baby to transfer that bacteria. But uh, you are made up of a lot of bacteria. And that bacteria you, you inherited from your mother. And it's, really? it, it's what protects us from a lot of things. 
So is there differences than what ha happens during pregnancy um, in the biome and stuff like that? Is that a critical time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, mother's huh. not, if a woman's not healthy when she's having a baby, she's obviously not going to provide the same protection as a, as a healthy mother. Boy, I wonder how long some of this stuff really filters down into the world where we can, you know, actually take action. I guess it's happening now because if you get your biome report, you, you know what foods are uh, beneficial to your biome and what foods aren't. And then the business model is brilliant because even before you get your test, you can get a subscription to have their supplements and their products coming. Well, that, right? That's where, that's where I, I, I caution. <laughs> if, you, if the thing's all about providing pills for somebody, I'm concerned that there might be biases, but you know, you have, you have to, you know, a third of what you read, a third of what you, you hear and a third of what you see is kind of a way of life. So you have to kind of dig through the information and, and, have some rationale what you actually believe you're given because it, it's all about making money too and, and some sometimes you're given stuff that might not be just exactly what you need hey that's a function of capitalism yep. and it's not all good that's for sure but it'd be the equivalent of you providing uh data to a customer and then also saying well even before we have your results hit the subscription button we'll get you all the nutrients we need for your acre of land or whatever amendments well there's one thing there's one thing we have built into us that unfortunately we do a bad job with kids is and you've raised kids when they're little they'll sit at the dinner table and they won't eat you try to feed them something they won't eat it uh, and we force it down them well we have the ability as human beings to understand what we actually want to eat now we develop bad habits and crave things that are probably bad for us but mm -hmm. you know if you smell something and you don't want to eat it or you don't crave it uh, that's because you don't need it Kids when they're little, and I used to give my son a hard time because he didn't eat anything, but he knew what he wanted. I mean, some people have said a chicken will never starve to death. A chicken knows what it needs to eat, and it only eats what yeah. it needs. Um, stupid as a chicken is, they they retain that ability to understand what it needs for their, their, their body process. And as humans, we have that built in. We just ignore it too much because we have that extra five beers we didn't need and things like that. But, um, <laughs> Uh, we do know, and, and that a lot of people, you've heard a lot of naturopaths and, and, and holistic people say, they'll smell it before they eat it, and if they don't want it, they put it down. Um, some of that's just in their own mind, but uh, a lot of it's real. If you smell something and you don't like the smell of it, or you don't crave it after you smell it, then you probably don't need to eat it. Well, you think about the inherent intelligence, even in, in something like uh, the plants that you talk about, whether it's you know a tree that knows when to uh, turn turn its leaves a certain color and, and prepare for winter and or, or or plants that when you talk about the complexity of the chemicals that get exuded from the, 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 the tip of the root sending signals to to the mycorrhizae to to gather what it needs to proliferate in the best most efficient possible way in a short window of time <laughs> you know in a field in Saskatchewan and these microscopic interactions are happening wholesale on a level we never met when i grew up the soil was just a holder for seed and fertilizer and chemical yeah and stuff came out of it yeah well that's before we understood it 100 percent. but you, you look at you talk about what plants do um plants have a do a lot of things we don't we don't realize i mean if a plant gets attacked by an insect it, it changes its chemistry and starts exuding compounds to kill that insect for instance canola if you have tarnished plant buck on canola uh, and you feed a heavy with boron, they go away because the, the plant has the ability to produce compounds to keep them away. Um, you know about predator mites. Um, people don't understand how predator, predator mites are actually attracted to plants. Well, it's not the plant that's being attacked by the insect that actually signals for the predator mites. The plant calls in the army from its neighbors. So it'll, it'll send out communications through the soil to the plants next door that don't have the same infestation, and they send the signal out to the predator mites. So there's a very complex uh, amount of communication between plants on, on the earth on what they do and how they thrive and how they live in their own community to help them through things like insect infestation and, and certain things. So um, we're getting to under understand that it's a lot more complex than we, we would like to believe, but I uh, don't want to come across as some kind of a holistic nut here, but um, there, there's more to what goes on in life 
at the plant level or human level than than we're paying attention to. And um, there's lots of things. I think more people are paying attention to these things. We have more and more people going to some more of these natural compounds and vitamins and holistic approach to things and paying attention to some of the things that we ingest that we shouldn't be ingesting. Um, and you know, we can spend a whole session on just what things in our life do we eat that we shouldn't have late be eating and that are available on the shelf that just are poisons to the body. Um, you know, well, Hey, here, here, here's a theory. Uh, do plants even want to be eaten? They can't run away. How do they defend themselves from things that want to eat them uh, beyond a watermelon? You're going to poop out a seed. Okay. That makes sense. You know, the fruit fruit, but, uh, you know, even in this biome, they said very simply, only 50% of people's biome responds in a positive, beneficial way to broccoli. What the hell are we doing disciplining our children to eat that stuff? <laughs> I like broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> With cheese whiz on it, though, to be no, fair. Like, no, really? I mean, Come just on. Just a little bit of butter. You like bro broccoli? Just a little bit of butter on it. Steamed. Fantastic food. I don't know if that broccoli wants to be eaten. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, plants, don't, be, plants uh... don't want to be eaten. And, and the simple fact there is if, if an insect bites a plant, it starts to, if it's healthy, it starts to change uh, certain alkaloids in the plant to cyanides to stop that infestation. So, no, plants don't want to be eaten. Read up on it, man. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me, and that's why. I mean, I'm I'm glad when somebody condones just eating a lot of steak. And, and I think it's a very dangerous trend, too. Like, I... I I agree with you that uh, different folks could thrive off different diets. I think the problem becomes when when one side of the equation uh, or the political spectrum starts to tell you, well, I'm a great vegetarian and you really ought to stop eating animals because it's hurting the planet. Well, we all know, I mean, 60 million buffalo in North America is sort of how we got here with the soils that we have. And not everybody has these soils on planet Earth. We're extremely lucky we have a geography of success, as Peter Zeehan would put it, uh, where we have this prairie, the Midwest soils and, and the Canadian prairies. We're going to be a big deal in the world going forward. We already are. Well, if you re if you get that book, One Man's Food, you know, you'll see in One Man's Food, that book suggests that probably a quarter of our population should be vegetarian. A quarter? Perfect. They, I just don't want them to ban me from having steak and cancel me if I'm eating meat. No, one man's food suggests that you as a typo need, need red meat. And what percentage of, of, of folks with uh, typo is the most ubiquitous type of blood, isn't it? Like yeah. the oldest blood type Yeah, has a lot to do with ancestry and evolution. And some these, some of these newer blood types yeah. are well, three, more three adapted quarters to are, modern three agriculture. Of our population needs some kind of red meat in their diet. Well, to me, you can't tell us our brain went from 300 grams in the trees, you know what I'm talking about, to 1,300 grams on the savanna without eating a lot of liver and, and, and ruminants with uh, our ability to throw spears and stones and communicate with the whites of our eyes silently and all that. I mean, I, I love all that um, history of man, so to speak, going, going way back, but I think it's paramount to how we developed over a very long period of time. So I'm a big fan of eating ruminants and I enjoy it wholeheartedly. Um, well, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, very much so. Um, we could talk about that for a long time, but it's really, it's a really interesting thing. Did you ever think about starting a company along that vein, given the success of, of a &L labs in the, in the agricultural sphere? I mean, you could, it sounds like you could almost do this for, for people similar to Vial. No, I'm a plant physiologist. My love is plant physiology. Yeah. I, I do the, the, the the human health because I want to stay healthy. I want to be around for a while. Well, you're, you're a very interesting, you know, when we started talking, I just became really fascinated about you personally. And, and of course the business that you build as an entrepreneur, give us a snapshot of, of why you started a company in 1984, what it looked like and where you're at today with your organization. Well, how it started was I was, I was working for another company and I was the, the marketing agronomist for the seed company. And I was, going around the countryside, putting on presentations to farmers, much like I do today, on growing a crop, in this case, corn, um, how to do it right, the right fertility program, and, and just I would be the, the consulting agronomist when they had problems. And I was at this one seminar putting on a presentation to a group of farmers, and there was corn growers, and 
this particular room, there was potato growers. And a couple of potato growers approached me at the end of the session and said, uh, um, we would really like to talk to you about producing a lab that works on research on potato production because we've got some real issues and we're not getting the information from the universities and research institutions that we think we need. And we want to put some money towards producing or putting together a company that does this. So um, that's how the company started. And from there, um, and it's just my love of physiology and, and on farm hands, getting your hands dirty and making it work. Um, from there, we just evolved. So we went from one crop to another. And over the 35 plus years that we've been in business, uh, we do the field research even today. I mean, we get involved with grower groups. Now we're involved with cannabis growers and tell them how to grow it properly. Uh, we've been we've been commissioned to come out to other countries like China and help them with their population needs as in production, improving their productivity, reducing their environmental impact because they, they, they throw up everything but the kitchen sink at their crop and they don't pay attention to the environment. And so we've been involved in in that type of work and research work all over the world on, on helping farmers just do a better job of growing a particular crop. So it's just evolved over time that we're an information source for farmers that's not biased. I mean, we don't sell product. We don't sell fertilizer. We keep inventing new tools like our soil health tests now. Uh, we're actually producing um, biostimulants that other people will sell based on our research. Uh, first of its kind in the world, we actually have a vaccine for crops now to control virus. We've got one patented registered ready to be produced here on the cucumber mosaic virus, which just about wiped out our cucumber industry here. We got one just about ready to release on rugos, on tomatoes. Uh, we're looking at a bunch of different virus inoculations. So again, just like you take a, a vaccine for 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 COVID, um, we have one for plant diseases, and we got a number of plant diseases we're looking at. So we've been very much a research institution, um, and our focus is coming up with solutions for farmers. And, you know, soil tests, we keep adding to it. We have more information on the soil test. We have our mapping software now that maps out the soil test so that, you know, farmers' numbers don't mean a lot to farmers, but farmers are very visual people, so we interpret that information visual, visually. So that's how the company evolved over time. Um, we had an issue with people not wanting to soil sample, uh, so we started up a soil sampling company for our clients, so we go and get the samples. That evolved into the Devron group coming on board and offering us a, a better network of people that will go out and take soil samples for farmers because soil sampling is a lot like mending fence and picking rocks to a lot of farmers. Just a job they don't want to do. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, yeah. we try to put these resources in place to, to help that get done. Um, and now Devron's actually a part of the company. Uh, we started a and Biologicals because of this, this lack of information in the industry for understanding that soil biome and, and that plant to biological relationship. Um, that's how it's evolved. I mean, it's just that we have drone company. We have a bunch of drones that we fly. We're heavily involved in satellite research and using satellites to gather information and build algorithms. Um, so just anything we can work on in research that allows us to gather information for production agriculture that, for solutions. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of, I'm very interested. What has it been like for you personally building a company like you have since 1984 and now it's grown into all these different things, but you seem like a very science oriented person. Uh, and yet it seems as though your, your company has just been an outcropping of trying to solve problems for producers. But did you find that your temperament is particularly well suited for entrepreneurship, given your your level of research and uh, knowledge, or ne is it just been a pain in the ass to grow a company? Ne never just trying to get. Never really thought about it much. I mean, I've got a lot of very talented people to work for me. We've got, you know, twenty five to thirty PhDs and masters people doing this research here. Um, so a lot of really talented people. So you know, it's like I hire good people to help me with this research. I mean, they have the same passion I have on the research piece, and we just kind of evolve that way. So um, running the company is something that uh, just is part of getting it done, um, I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> Interesting. You never thought about it much, and yet you've built a successful company that's doing a lot for for producers in the world. Um, My first love is the agronomy and, and providing the information and, and digging into the solutions. Right. So tell us about, you were, you were telling me about how you physically do your research, because here's my conundrum. Like, I love all this stuff. I'm fascinated by it. I don't retain that much. I can retain some of the bigger picture things. And I, and I just sit there and I go, I wish I could read this mineral. What's that green book? The mineral. Mineral nutrition, you know, mineral, higher plants, Marshner. Yes. I wish I could read that three or four times like Elston. And I wish the I could talk like Greg Patterson. And, He's got four since then. <laughs> three it, since then. You know, and, and at some point too, I, and farmers must feel this way. What, at what point, you know, uh, is it just saturation and what do we need to know? But you, you say you read papers on the weekend and sometimes from five in the morning till 10, 10 in the morning before work. Gets, what does it take to gather your level of knowledge and what does the average person really need to, you know, do to execute on that? Um, like I say, the information's out there. The problem is there, there's too much information. What, what do you need to look for? So my suggestion to anybody, even myself, I, you know, I, I look to people I respect that have knowledge and, and ask them, you know, where can I get this information? You know, where did this come from? A lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff we're, we're writing now because people ask us to put it in paper. Uh, a lot of it is just working with farmers in field and say, okay, what works and doesn't work. I mean, let's try this. Let's like, what is our problem here? Why are we doing this? I mean, we have, we have a lot of hardware that, manufacturers produce for us and how many times does a farmer take that piece of equipment home and take the torch to it and cut it up and make it work the way it should um mm -hmm. so farmers because of their passion have the ability to to solve problems because they're 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 in the dirt hands-on getting it done so i guess that's just how it's evolved i mean we look at a problem we see if we can find a solution i mean the solution's out there you just got to have an imagination to kind of work around it. Hmm. Well, it's been a very interesting uh, conversation. Usually I try and keep these conversations under an hour, but I just felt that there are so many things that I wanted to speak to you about. And uh, I know there'll be a lot of areas in, in future listens that uh, I go, oh, I wish I asked them about this or asked them about that. Or what does that actually mean? I wish I had time to Google it all and, and find it all out. But the challenge is, as you say, Greg, the more that you learn, the less you know. Yeah. And that is, uh, <laughs> that is a tough Well, one. we got we got down a bit of a rabbit hole on the human part, but uh, there is, <laughs> there's, I mean, you are what you eat, and it's the, about food we eat. And we've got a lot of problems we cause ourselves because we eat the wrong things. But um, there's good information, and there's a whole bunch of garbage out there, just like everything. You know, believe a third of what you read, a third of what you see, and a third of what you hear, and you can come someplace in the middle. Um, but I have, I, I raise my kids the same way. My kids are all, all very conscious of what they eat. Um, my, my youngest daughter, she went to university for um, health sciences, a four year degree. Then she went on to uh, Chinese medicine and she now opened up her own clinic in BC and she does acupuncture and talks to people about nutrition and she has a degree in dealing with the elderly and all kinds of things like that. So she's taken it to heart and she's, she opened her, her clinic just recently and she's, she's busier than she can handle. So, well, just like, you know, as we grow up and we get older, we start to get concerned about things like how, how our health is and what we can do to, to optimize our health and, and live as, as long as we can, not only maybe for our enjoyment, but of course, you know, we want to contribute and we want to give back as much as we can. And we want to foster everybody that we, we become responsible for, you know, uh, for us as, I guess, as speaking as a man, as a, as a father and a, and a, and a life partner and, and as a, as a boss and leader in the community and stuff like that. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of parallels where this is all going as we become more knowledgeable and we improve not only on the, on the soil health, but our, our own health is the biggest outcome. Like I think, I think that's the biggest conversation is how to keep people happy and healthy because happy and healthy people, they don't, they tend not to go and destroy things or, you know, um, hungry people are pretty dangerous people as we can see. So we want to keep the world happy and healthy and fed. And, and I think it's fantastic 
when you when you have an opportunity to talk with intellectual people like yourself that are moving the ball forward in agriculture and it gives me great hope of where we're going and and really the way that you speak about agriculture in a very common sense uh farmer uh nuts and bolts get it done kind of way and yet you're adding in uh data that that makes a difference that can influence decisions i think is a, is a big deal and i think we're doing a fantastic job I just think we can continue to improve as we as we know more. So it's meant a lot to me that you came on the show. I was really excited to hear everything that you had to say today. And um, you know, I, I just I think I think folks are really gonna enjoy this. I'm glad we got this snapshot of your knowledge. Um and I would encourage anybody that wants to get more of this every winter. I mean, I wanna I wanna discipline myself so every winter I can sit down and when you have these sessions. You know, it's tough to maybe take time out of the day or whatever, but you can always, you know, get the recordings or whatever. But, you know, you put on five or six sessions, and I'm sure you're going to go back to in person at some point. But the knowledge that you can get by taking this every year and spending that, I don't know what they collectively would be, 15 or 20 hours of of incredible knowledge, um, at least it inspires you to do do better, I think, and opens your mind to what possible, even though, <laughs> a lot of it's um, hard to know how to implement, but uh, at least you're presenting some alternative reality where, you know, you can work towards a better state of perfection. Um, you do a tremendous job with those seminars. We will be going back to the in-person ones this year. Uh, we did the, Oh, well, yeah, we did this, the, the online sessions just because of COVID and everything else. Um, every year we do level one, two, and three uh, in, and I like the in-person ones. It's an eight hour, it's a full day. But that interaction really you get to answer questions. The Q and A piece is is better than just a presentation. I mean, be able to answer mm -hmm. questions and you know have farmers sitting in the room or retail people that have issues with you know they've seen in the field, being able to, to openly discuss those in the room, um, and everybody contributes. And yeah, I saw that same thing, or yeah, this is how we solve that, and yeah, that makes good sense. I mean, that interaction in a in a, a small setting is 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 really valuable. Um, and you know, I'm, I've got quite a sales force now. They're all learning how to put on those sessions, so so we can get out to more farmers, uh, more more areas to, to put these sessions on. So um, it's yeah, we're going to go back to in person. Thank you, Greg, for your your time and attention. I know it was it was uh, your busy guy. It, we you know we had to schedule this ahead to keep your calendar clear, and uh, but you contributing your time um, for us to hear what you have to say, I think, is invaluable. How would producers go about uh, getting a hold of you or or your organization to help them with their operations well we have our, we have a website uh, it's easy to get a hold of us on analcanada.com um, phone the office um, on our website we've got representatives all across Canada that um, they can contact and and we, we do most of our business through retail locations so a lot of the retailers we do business with across Canada can get information to farmers from us so we've got quite a network of people to deliver this information. Lots of material online and tech bulletins. And we try to put as much as we can, distill it down into handouts and tech bulletins that, you know, for farmers to read, ag agronomists to read. So, it, you know, they get answers to some of their questions. Congratulations on the company that you've built and everything that you've achieved. That's no small feat uh, in a person's life. And thank you for, sharing your knowledge with us today and with producers uh throughout the years and i'm sure uh you know given all the the vitamins and stuff you're taking and in, in your diet you're going to live a very long time and maybe 30 will turn into 50 will turn into 70 years to 100 years you're still helping producers with you know modern technology and stuff so really great to to hear more about your knowledge and get to know you better greg and thanks for your contribution to agriculture i think it's a really big deal what you've done building this company and and two i i think it'll be a company that will go on go on uh in perpetuity uh you know it'll continue building you've got that momentum that it'll be something that just goes off in the future and what a what a legacy you've built you must feel very proud well, i got good people falling in my footsteps so i, I feel good about that Good for you. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah. Thanks for the conversation. It's been awesome. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm.